you know, uh, I just wanted to be a professional musician. I wanted to make my living as a worker, if you will. It was great to connect with today's guest. What an interesting artist. What a great path he's led in the music world. What an inspiring and thoughtful person. I'm Jason Heath. This is Contrabass Conversations. And we are talking with Mark Helios, who has done, you name it, the list goes on and on. So many great people he's worked with. Don Cherry, Anthony Braxton, Anthony Davis, Cecil Taylor. So many great artists. He just put out an album with Jane Ira Bloom called Some Kind of Tomorrow. We'll link up to that in the show notes. And we talk about all kinds of things, what life has been like during the pandemic, making this remote album, remote collaboration in general, and all sorts of lessons learned. Mark is great. You'll have a great time with this one for sure and learn a lot, I'll bet. Thank you to our sponsors, Dorico, Ear Trumpet Labs, and Modacity. More on them later, but let's get into today's conversation with Mark Helios. I see in the background you got a clarinet there. I do. Um, <laughs> I, st- <laughs> I started playing it two years ago. Wow. Well, I mean, I played it when I was 19 for like six months. Okay. And I actually learned how to read music on the clarinet. Oh, wow. It or not. Yeah. But um, I was touring so much and doing bass du jour and spending a lot of time in hotel rooms <clears throat> that. Mm-hmm. You know, the sitting with a score paper and writing is great, but um, it, it doesn't give you the tactile experience, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. So I say, what can I take on the road and practice Yeah, and annoy my bandmates? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I started playing the clarinet, man. I really, you know, I really got into it. Wow. Yeah, it's certainly more portable than any kind of bass. It's a lot yeah, of you yeah, just you throw just, it in the bag. I fit it in my, in my suitcase, my carry-on bag, and... That's it. That and the bow. And that yeah. was it. You know? well- well, it's got to be kind of nice playing something that I, I play. I I used to be a uh, an orchestra teacher, so I had to go to school and play a little bit of everything. You know? right, but right. it's got to be kind of cool to play something that requires your breath. You know, that was actually a consideration yeah. because my bass teacher always used to um, talk about singing mm-hmm. in terms of understanding the idea of phrase marks and things in, in classical music because. Uh, you know, as a string player, if you get your technique together, you can basically bow a sound for like days, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but the idea of, of understanding how breath influenced how people phrased was very important, you know, mm-hmm. for a string player to, to get. So now that I'm playing the clarinet some, it's like, wow, I really get it, you know. Is it, it, it do, do you feel like it's affected the way you play bass if you take a solo or something like that? Just thinking, thinking like, especially if that's what you got on the road back when we were on the road, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, uh, like at the hotel room and then you go on the gig. I, I think it must have an well, impact. It, you know what it is? I think, Jason, is um, the idea of starting an instrument as an adult professional musician mm-hmm. is on some level really wonderfully humbling, mm-hmm. but also... Um, it, it, I, it, the short answer is yes, it did affect my bass playing. Okay, but w- what I'd like to say is that it um, it sort of reoriented the process of absorbing music and exploring music through a different medium, mm-hmm. and and also without a lot of technique. Mm-hmm. So then you're you're on the the trail of trying to develop some technique, but you also have this sort of developed musical mind. Mm-hmm. So it sort of comes quickly. Uh, and you also know how to slow down, uh, you know, the physical thing so you can get it, you know, good enough to play something. Mm-hmm. Not right. Ru- you wouldn't, you don't rush. I went stepwise. I really studied on my own. You know, I, I, also the clarinet community in New York is incredible. If you take up the clarinet, you will have like a coterie of instant friends that you wouldn't believe. And the joke's like, what did some, did you lose a bet? You know, you took up the clarinet. <laughs> did you lose a bet? Uh, what was the other one? <laughs> Um, oh, I forgot. There were a couple, a couple lines, you know, but that was one of the ones. Did you lose a bet? Did uh, oh, I forgot the other one? There was another good one, but they call it the misery stick. Uh huh. You know. Uh huh. That's but great. They, they all. Get, I mean, I got free lessons from great clarinet players in New York. Wow. You wow. know. I remember how disappointed I was in my own clarinet playing back when I picked it up like 
15 years ago or whatever. I never I never spent enough time on it. Um, some of the wind instruments, though, like bassoon, for whatever reason, re- really just the resonance of that reed, it really like tapped into my bass player brain. Oh, totally. Yeah, but, the low frequencies. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but boy, the fingering system, that was humbling. That was like solving, yeah. you know, d- complex <laughs> equations every time I tried to figure out how to how to get around. There's also quite a stretch in the low the lower keys, mm-hmm. you know, for the for one of the, you know, just to, to the, the distance. Mm-hmm. And then the the you know, when you're doing combined fingerings, your hands start to look like this, you know. Like. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, I, I got to play contrabass clarinet a couple times too, and and that was really like your entire head vibrates. Wow, it's really weird. Wow, yeah, yeah. that's one of those awe-inspiring instruments. I think I think it's so that that and again, yeah, that's gotta that's gotta resonate somewhere in that bass player. <laughs> well, even Brain. even the clarinet, um, I, I got a little worried because it it seems so loud when you're playing it, like mm-hmm. inside your head, and. You know, like the the hearing thing is one is a thing. As we get older, we worry at what point is this not going to be working as mm-hmm. well. You know, mm-hmm. and <laughs> <laughs> you're a little younger, so it's it maybe not your concern. But being you know being around live music all your life. It, you know, can take a toll. Yeah, I'm a little younger, but I definitely remember I used to live by the Jazz Showcase in Chicago. That was like mm-hmm. one of the most fortuitous places we lived because I, w- I, w- I was able to just walk. Mm-hmm. It was maybe a quarter mile. And so my wife and I found ourselves like, hey, let's go to the Jazz Showcase. And we started, <laughs> but I remember being right in front of the bell of the trumpet, you know, on more than one occasion and thinking, you know, and I have my share of years in rock bands and stuff like that. Yeah, so yeah, hearing's on yeah. my mind for, sh- for sure. Yeah, it, it, uh, I, I went to an audiologist. Um, a couple number of years ago, and I guess it was four or five years ago, and he was shocked at how good my ears were because he says, you've been playing professional musicians for like 45 years? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, don't, he said, don't be proud because it's just genetics in your oh. case because, you know, because a lot of friends of mine had serious issues, you know, yeah. with yeah. hearing. And, it's it's one of those things. Like I, I remember, you know, I, mo- I mostly play symphonic music, so it's it's still an issue. It's a, maybe in a it, certainly in a different environment. But I remember, you know, doing some St. Patrick's Day gig back in Chicago and looking behind me, and there were eight a row of eight music stands behind me, and then I think another row of eight. And I thought, what's that for? And we're rehearsing, and then from the back of the auditorium, we hear the bagpipe and oh. snare drum. <laughs> Or come up and line up right behind the bass section. And I used to pride myself in not wearing earplugs. I now wear earplugs whenever I need them, but I yeah. went, the whole bass section went running for earplugs on that one. Yeah, well, <laughs> uh, yeah, the, 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 dub, the, uh, the bagpipes, man, those <laughs> things are loud, you know? <laughs> Like the Irish Nagaswaram or something. They're really loud. Well, I remember back, I went to Northwestern in Chicago, and I remember the dean of the school had some bagpipe fl- player friend that he would let practice, or that was the rumor anyway. But you would hear, I would be at the opposite end of the building, and and, and this bagpipe player would set up shop in, the, a, mm-hmm. in one of the practice rooms, and he would just clear the entire place out. I mean, I can't imagine how you could be in a little room like that playing bagpipes. It's one of those. You imagine <laughs> it come bouncing back at you? It would be... Yeah, those things were meant to play outside. Right, for sure. Right. Inspire you know? troops <laughs> into battle. Exactly, <laughs> we're coming for you. You know, that's the that's the the scary signal of those things. You know, that whole adult learning th- thing is so interesting to me. I, I, and, and picking up an instrument later in life, I've been working with a, a choreographer here in San Francisco. I've been teaching him bass lessons. He hasn't been mm-hmm. teaching me choreography, although we should actually probably trade. But it's sure. so interesting. He has won all these salsa competitions, just like a real high-level artist. And mm-hmm. it's been so interesting, but total beginner on bass. But he's been he's learned something at such a high level, and it's been really interesting and educational for me to see how how the adult uh, an adult who's very enthusiastic and passionate about what they're doing how they learn because it's like if there are certain right, things that right. take their time there are certain things that are much faster but it's it's something that I, I it's it's pretty been pretty remarkable on my end well if you think about it whatever the medium they're working in if you got somebody who's highly accomplished in, in a discipline like that mm-hmm. the process is the same mm-hmm. in terms of Patience, fortitude, perseverance, things like that. You're not getting frustrated. Mm -hmm. You know, some kind of humility so that you can learn. Um, So in a way, we've done the work of the process of learning all our lives. And I'm I'm, I'm a big self-educator. I've always done that, you know. Um, So 
a lot of friends of mine were, were surprised. They, they think it's really cool that I do that. These I'm also now I'm studying guitar on my own. Wow. Because I played guitar when I was a teenager. And I'm also looking for a certain sort of, sort of the micro digital uh, things. Because I, I, I haven't been actually having hand problems, but I'm just sort of forestalling the inevitable by getting more digital stuff happening. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. like, so... And also, you know, kind of studying harmony through the guitar, which I never did. It was mostly I, I did it abstractly, you know, because I, I wasn't a pianist. Yeah. So when I studied theory, um, which I did a lot of, um, I did it all in my ear and, and on paper, you know, because I didn't have a piano facility at that time. Yeah. It's got to be so interesting to approach the guitar then, too, right? And it's like, it's so so close to what we do, yet so far away, too. You when know? you get to that major third, man, all bets are off. That G to B, this, you know, this like the fingering process. So I've been doing like very, very steadfast scale practice just to break through. It's kind of like playing through the break on the clarinet mm -hmm. and getting through the octave on the G string on the, on the bass, you know, going in and out of thumb position. Yeah. Uh, so it's it, you know it's endemic to the guitar that, yeah, it's fourths all the way across. Then suddenly there's this glitch, mm -hmm. and then the you know so plus you know the bass being for slow-minded individuals <laughs> only four strings. When you add two more, it's it's complete. You know. <laughs> That's a joke, by the way. Yeah. This episode is brought to you by Dorico, the advanced music notation software from Steinberg. And one of the coolest things about this piece of software, there's so many things, but one of them is their popover option. And it has sped up things so much for me when I'm working in scores. Here's senior product manager Daniel Spreadbury on how popover mode works. There's like hundreds of notations that you might want to create and trying to remember what to type, you know, oh, is it command shift alt? you know Vulcan death grip seven <laughs> for this particular notation but the nice thing about a popover is all you have to remember is the letter of the thing you want to create so d for dynamics t for tempo m for meter k for key signature it might seem like a simple thing but you would not believe how much that has sped up my workflow and i'm not even really a composer i do a lot of arrangements i do a lot of exercises but it has taken my workflow probably at least up to five times faster just that one mode i can't say enough good things about dorico i love it i use it every single day there's a free version dorico sc that you can download that lets you do practically everything for up to two stabs so Check it out. Dorico.com will take you to their page on Steinberg's website. And thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast. I'm so happy that my course, Beginners Classical Bass, is out in the world on Discover Double Bass. And we've been getting some great feedback. Here's Barry Green, instructor of bass at The Ohio State University, former principal bassist of the Cincinnati Symphony and author of The Inner Game of Music. Barry writes about the course. This wonderful, extensive course includes 14 chapters of 66 lessons varying in length from one to eight minutes each. It is so comprehensive. While it is called a beginner's course, this only means that the course begins with the parts of the instrument, including how to take the bass out of the case. However, it also takes the player through the most advanced left and right hand techniques, including shifting, pivoting, harmonics, positions up to the thumb position, tuning the bass, scales and arpeggios, as well as left hand techniques of dynamics, bow placement, articulations, including portato, staccato, and slurring. Barry, thank you so much. And folks, if you haven't checked it out, you can find it through the link in the show notes or just visit discoverdoublebass.com slash Jason Heath. Well, something that I I, uh, I started on violin and then went to bass and then I picked up the violin back when I was teaching orchestra because I realized the, not uselessness, but it was not very practical to demo on bass for a bunch of high school kids. You know, I'd yeah. have to like go to the back and pay. And so I started practicing violin again and hmm. I got to this sort of depressing realization that my brain sort of was thinking faster on violin than bass. Like I was all of a sudden thinking, wow, I can play. I'm not very in tune or great, great sound, right, but, right. but the, the, my brain was just moving faster. I, I, I don't know if you've experienced that on other instruments. Cause I mean, it's what we do on the bass is so there's just this physicality to it that it's just, you know, it's so different on an instrument like violin. I think that also might be a, I've, I've noticed a difference with the guitar for sure, but I don't know that my ability to process musical information is any different in the mm -hmm. sense, you know, I think we all have like our abilities, to, you know, some people can process huge amounts of information, musical information and remember it. Mm -hmm. And yeah. others of us live more in the moment, if mm -hmm. you will, you know, sure. So, but I do notice that the, the whole 
uh, sort of velocity thing is different when you get to these smaller instruments, especially from the perspective of somebody who's played this larger instrument for so long, you know. But I have to say that, again, coming back to the bass from the guitar, there's something liberating about it, something that make making you think a little differently. And, and, and uh, you know, I, I, in, in attempting to... Uh, do some of the stuff that I'm playing on guitar on the bass it's opened up some other pathways so it's a good thing that's you know? cool but also that I'm thinking about it also from the standpoint of like real subtle vibrato things and left hand control things mm -hmm. you know uh, in terms of how to manipulate the string especially with like extended techniques and things like that yeah. you know wow. the other thing I did I, you know I, I, I play basketball for like a workout thing for myself and um, I had like a little bit of a shoulder pain, so I started shooting left-handed for 10 days, only left-handed. Wow. And it got really way, way better, like amazing. And I noticed some, when I went back to shooting right-handed, my percentage went up. Interesting. So it's, it's, I think that this kind of activating the brain pathways as you get older, I, I have an agenda here because it's like, you know, you, you hear about like deficit, as you get older and things like that. Mm -hmm. And I really don't want that. So I'm exercising myself in a lot of ways. And I think this kind of learning as, you know, oh Jesus, sorry. No worries. Uh, let me tell you. Yeah, no worries. I'm doing an uh, interview, man. I'll call you back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that, that's, um, that's the beauty of not being alive. Although we could leave that in just for fun. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, um, I, I think that uh, when I look around at, at uh, you know, people in, the, in, in our country and, and the way things are, I'm not going to get the political per se, but I think that it's really important for people to continue learning all their lives, mm -hmm. no matter what they do, you know, and that's why reading is like a big thing for me and, you know, self-education, if you will. Keeping track of what you practice is so critical. And my practice companion, Modacity, it does it for me. It's so awesome. Here's Modacity founder and CEO Mark Gelfo on how this works. Accounting before the spreadsheet was manually handwritten ledgers. And that's where most musicians have been for the last 200 years. And it's time to automate that and save some time and let people focus on what's really important, which is performing on their instrument. And that is exactly what Modacity has done for me. I feel so much more focused and energized and enthusiastic about practicing. I love this app so much. You can learn more at modacity.co and visit our website for a special offer for lifetime access for this app. Such a cool piece of technology. And thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast, Modacity. This episode is brought to you by Ear Trumpet Labs. They make an incredible mic for upright bass called the Nadine. And six-time Grammy-winning jazz bassist and former Contra Bass Conversations guest, Christian McBride is a big fan. Christian says, as an acoustic bassist, it's very important for me to have this instrument amplified as naturally as possible. What I love about this microphone is that it makes the instrument sound exactly how I hear it in my head. Honestly, I don't know if you can get a better review than that. The Nadine is an instrument-mounted condenser mic with an incredibly clear natural sound and great feedback rejection. Ear Trumpet Labs is offering a free t-shirt with mic purchase from their website. Just visit www.eartrumpetlabs.com slash contrabass to claim yours and learn more about Nadine. It's so interesting to me. That's something I think about all the time. And as you see people go through the decades, you know, I'm 45, so I'm not, I'm not 75, but I'm not 25 either. And, and right. I see some other people that I've known since college and 45 can look real different depending on what you've been doing. If you've been like eating McDonald's and driving to work oh. and super stressed and, you know, that versus, uh, you know, and so it's just so interesting. And as I see, it's, it's just remarkable to me. I've, I spent a lot of time with Barry Green, the wonderful Barry mm -hmm. Green inner game of music who is closing in on 80 and right. a little bit of time with Francois Raboff who is turning well, 90 at yeah, this point. Yeah, I know. And, and actually <laughs> Mark Dresser saw a concert of his and he, he called me and said, man, this guy played two sets and it was hardcore. And he was what, 85 at the time mm -hmm. or 84? Mm -hmm. And I mean, I was like, damn, okay. 
it it yeah. says something about r- whether or not one adopts r- robots approach to the base it really says something that he can get up and play two hours of a continuous bass yeah. you know into yeah. your 80 into his 80s or not 90 at this point and it, that's um that's credible. and it's also one of those things that makes me realize wow if you can stay physically you know healthy and fit music is one of these things you can do pretty much indefinitely you know bar i mean i everybody get, things can happen but it's just it's remarkable to to see well we don't really have retirement in our sites yeah. i mean as a musician you you know part of the joy of doing it is doing it every day practicing even you know mm-hmm. and and you've had a good perspective on this in the sense that you go around and talk to people that that are um have developed a, a learning process or teaching process. Mm-hmm. So whether it's teaching or learning, it's the same thing. Mm-hmm. And so you've gotten to see how that affects people. And, and also you've gotten to the benefit of kind of sourcing a great deal of the, a great number of approaches mm-hmm. and different mm-hmm. approaches. So um, clearly this learning as you, as you uh, continue to live is, 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 it's clear to you that it's a positive thing, right? I mean, that, that's obvious. Yeah. And, and actually to play the instrument well professionally, you have to keep up mm-hmm. and keep getting better, mm-hmm. you know, not just holding the line, you know. Yeah. Well, it's something that, you know, if I, I I've, again, a symphonic playing is kind of my bag. Um, and it's, it's really interesting to look at the different paths someone's life can take if they're in an orchestra for 20, 30, 40 years. And I'm, I'm, I'm always in, now there are some people, I, I know one bassist I shall not name, but mm-hmm. he retired and there's no evidence in his place that he ever played bass. There's no, I don't even <laughs> think there's a bass. There's no yeah. poster of the ensemble. He was just I, like punching you know, the clock. I find that really odd. I you know. know, but then it's so exciting. Like I, I'm talking. Talking uh, this week with Peter Ruffay, who's one of the bassists in the L.A. Phil. He's been there. He, I think he's 70 at this point. He's been there 40 mm-hmm. years, I want to say, and then played before wow. that. And is during the pandemic, he's been making the doing these Beatles arrangements and putting them out. And just and a, a co- friend of mine here in the San Francisco Symphony, Brian Marcus, he's been playing also 40 years and is just as into it. He's like, oh, I, ca- I can't wait to go to work and I can't wait. And that makes yeah. me that that I I get so. Uh, I, I feel so optimistic talking to people who are in that situation and even if it's something where you could feel like you're getting lost in the crowd like you're one of eight and then one of a hundred I guess it's cool yeah, to see that's, people that speaks to issues of ego and things like that mm-hmm. and, and and you know one's perspective I mean it, it's proof that uh that systemically the orchestra is not a total preventer of, of being a creative <laughs> musician there's a tendency for that to happen to a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Uh, and also the politics within a section. I mean, I've heard brutal stories. You know, I mean, yep. we all studied with <laughs> classical teachers and I've done a lot of orchestral playing myself, but I, uh, the la- I played in a chamber orchestra professionally, mm-hmm. but I didn't want to be in a symphony orchestra professionally. First of all, the commitment would have been too great for what I wanted to do otherwise. I wanted to do it all, but that's not possible, right? But right. I did play in a chamber orchestra for a couple of years. Wow. And uh, and I was offered a, a gig in a contemporary ensemble in New York when I first got to New York in like 77, 78. But I immediately went on the road with Dewey Redman and that sort of blew that out of the water because I wasn't going to turn down a tour in Europe to, you know. Right. I mean, it's just like the path kind of diverged at that point. Right. I had the naive notion that I could do it all. <laughs> it's, it's tough. <laughs> <laughs> it is tough. It is, but, you know, on the other hand, uh, I've also seen the, uh, the sort of merging of the scenes, especially in New York, in terms of the bass players all know each other in, in whatever genre we're in, where there, there's a lot of really good collegial interest, you know, from, from the two worlds. Even though there's a, there are a lot of problems with the way they teach and, and all you know the educational systems and the universities that separate jazz and classical like never the twain shall meet, which I find maddening and you know regressive. Yeah, for sure. You know. For sure, and you know, what we, we bass players are kind of like the most obvious example of floating between those two worlds. But but so many other instruments too, and yeah, it's it's it always fascinating to me when like the departments are like not even in the same building; they're like across the campus yeah, from yeah. each other. <laughs> and this is this is uh, this is weird because in the I went to school in the early '70s, and I went to Livingston College, which is part of Rutgers University, mm-hmm. and I studied with Homer Mensch through Rutgers University, and. 
I had the most amazing theory teachers, and, I, and there were three campuses you could choose music courses from. One like real traditional campus where they studied, you know, we did common practice harmony and counterpoint. I had like three years of all that. You know, had to write a fugue. I mean, the whole deal, right? Mm -hmm. I got basically a composition education while I was majoring in bass, if you will. Um, plus, I, had, I was in this department that was heavily leaning toward jazz and new music and electronic music. So it, everything was available to me, and there was no stricture on me taking courses in any area. Mm -hmm. You know, so, so that's where I thought education was going naively <laughs> until they codified it and then separated it out as usual, you know. Yeah. I've always said this about Western culture. We're really good at analyzing, breaking things down, and separating them out to examine them. We just don't put them back together yeah. in the end. Yeah. You know? like, so our educations tend to be a bit fractious. Mm -hmm. And um, so again, I was like a self-educator by organizing my education and choosing from so many varied, wonderful people. It was like serendipity that I went there. You know. What what did you think you were going to be doing, at, like when you were in college? Because I know you ended up going to Yale at some point, yeah. right? If I um, yeah. did, were you were you thinking? Did you like if if you could go back in time and look at what you're doing now? Is this is this a path you were sort of dreaming of, or were you th what were you thinking you were going to be doing professionally? It was, yeah, it was probably a more generalized thing. I just wanted to be a musician. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I just wanted to be a professional musician. I wanted to make my living as a worker if you will. I mean, I came up working class. You know, my dad was a mechanic. There was no music in the family, per se. So I was the alien that landed, you know. And, and they thought it was curious, to say the least. And of course, you know, my working class parents from the Depression and World War II, no, you can't be a musician. It's too insecure. And I'm saying, really? Insecure? <laughs> what about all those people that are out of work? They're, you know, they didn't, they're yeah. not musicians, you know. Yeah. So, um, but the vision was really... It was probably a bit vague, but the fundamental thing was, you know, I remember going to hear the London Symphony, and they, there was an introduction, I think it was a piano concerto, and there was an introduction, the basses didn't come in for like 12 bars. Mm -hmm. And when the basses came in, it was like, you know, the sky opened. I heard eight double basses, and I went like, yeah, I'm doing that, you know? <laughs> I mean, literally, it was like that religious moment, you know? Um, so. That's another thing. I, I believe that people choose an instrument because of something physiological. Mm. It's like you mentioned the, mm -hmm. the bassoon. Mm -hmm. Just the low frequencies of the bassoon, you were immediately attracted to that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Because that's why you chose the bass, man. Yep, exactly. I had also... Because you re you were reversing the strings from the violin, you know? <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. I I have that I have that my my aha moment was certainly it was I think I was fifteen and I saw Gary Carr play with my local orchestra, the South Dakota Symphony, and I thought, who is this person? Where did he come from? And what what is that? And there was like an article in the Argus Leader, the local paper, about Gary and his background and talking about bass sounding like dark chocolate, which he probably said to thousands of local papers over the years. But mm -hmm. like so many people, I was one of those kids. Kids, you know, eating it up and watching him play the Paganini, Paganini Moses fantasy on the bass, and uh, that was it for so me. So, what I mean, to have seen that, how old were you then? I think I was 15, maybe 14, 15, something like that. And you hadn't seen anybody play the bass at that kind of level at that no, point, right? No. So, that must have been pretty shocking in a way. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Right. But, I, but also, it could be liberating too mm -hmm. uh, to, to realize that that's something else possible. Yeah. Yeah. But sure. per, I don't know that that would be I mean, you'd be like, whoa, what's that? <laughs> you know? Yeah, it was it was uh, it was fascinating for sure. Um, it, you know, the, the the growing up working class and then like going into music, that's like the classic, you know, what are you doing with your life? And I've for decades, you know, people, parents, whoever, I, I, like, like, should my kid go get a music degree? And that's one of those things that if you'd asked like 25 year old Jason, I would probably say only if you're a fool. And I I, I, I've sort of revised my opinion as I've gotten older, and maybe that's mm. because I've seen I've had all these students that have gone on and had great success in music, and I've and I've seen so many people 
uh, even if they don't end up playing professionally, people with a musical training, they seem to do pretty well in whatever they do. You know, I, that's sort of, yeah. and, I, and part of it is maybe that, that independent learning that you just have to develop, you know, uh, in, in, in the practice room or uh, the, the challenges of carving out a career. I don't know what it is, but I've definitely seen a lot of people get out of music, my wife included, <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and, and really uh, perform at a high level in whatever else they get into. Well, think about the, what it takes to get serious about an instrument. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the commitment level. I mean, if you're a young kid and you commit to that, it's like a, an athlete. Mm -hmm. Kids are, are, are natural athletes, but they work really hard at it, mm -hmm. right? You're not just learning the game. You're learning the bigger game, yeah. you know, which is, you know, this is what it takes. It takes work. It takes patience. It takes... Uh, the kind of patience where you you see incremental improvement, you don't expect immediate nirvana. And if you look around today, we see a lot of people falling in young people, especially falling into the trap of immediate gratification because there's so much available. And I'm not knocking them. I'm talking about the context they're coming up in. So the lesson learned from the the kind of commitment it takes to play an instrument, even as an amateur, you know, just a school kid, Every everybody that I know that studied an instrument in school and then became whatever, you know, never went a higher level than that, it affected how they went in life mm -hmm. the whole time. So I remember Regina Carter told me that, um, the violinist, that thank God for the Detroit school system because all these young black kids would not have had a chance to play an instrument if it hadn't been for the school system. And, and uh, you know, and the, and the music, they had a great music program in the school system. So the kids got an opportunity to try stuff out. And wow, amazing. All these people, be, it turns out they were like amazing musicians just waiting to happen. Yeah. You know? Yeah, those those big city public school systems. I know New York ha had had that. Uh, you know, uh, Chicago certainly. I look at all these people that went through the Chicago public schools and went on to. I believe Merle J. Isaac, this famous uh, arranger. I, th I I might be getting this wrong, but I think I'm right. I think he was a high school orchestra director in the Chicago public schools. So he ended up doing anybody who's taught in, in pu public orchestra at all has played Merle J. Isaac. He's like the classic arranger, and it's just it's so interesting. There's this one school, Lane Tech. In in Chicago and you look at musicians coming out of there in the 60s and 70s there's so many people that went on and it wasn't even a music focused school they had but they had a great band they had great orchestra yeah and yeah. it's just it's incredible what those public schools uh, did and it, ma it makes me so sad when I talk and now there's still some good things going on and I, I was just talking yesterday to one of the Chicago public school teachers who's a friend of mine they've got good but uh, but it's certainly changed since in the you know half century or whatever oh of course yeah. But but I think it speaks to the utility of music mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. everyone, I mean, there's a kind of common meme that music is this addendum to life. It's something that people do when they have extra time. But in fact, it becomes elemental in the education. It's been proven that it affects kids' brains in a positive way, mm -hmm. you know, in terms for learning, et cetera, you know. Yeah. It engages more aspects of the human brain than any other activity. Yeah, yeah. That's you know, been, been, you know, realized, you know, so, and if you look around at the vitality of older musicians in general, I mean, look at all the, I mean, Milt Hinton, for God's mm -hmm. sake, mm -hmm. you know, um, any number of, there's a bunch of older, old, well, right now we have all these older bass players and orchestras that we know, you mm -hmm. know, our, uh, revered elderly brethren who are still killing it. Yeah. So, I mean, Raboth is a freak example, yeah. in a way, you know. <laughs> But it, it it it's 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 incredible. Um, I'm 70 and I don't feel like it at all, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. except you know when I realize the aerobic thing isn't what it used to be. <laughs> <laughs> but that's another age. I look at people I know who who turned 70. I remember when my dad turned 70, and there's a there are a lot of different kinds of 70. That's like I was talking about. The, there are different kinds of 45. You see that uh, and those daily habits one does or doesn't do. They they just seem to uh, pile up exponentially as you start to approach yeah, that it, age. Anybody who was an athlete and continued working out throughout their adult life. And the, the cumulative effect of that is so positive. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like night and day, you know. I used to notice this when I would be on the road back in the day when we used to be on the road. <laughs> uh, you know, you'd land in Copenhagen Airport, which is huge, and you have a connection to a flight, 
and you walk two and a half miles to the flight. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at my, you know, aged brethren, you know, in wheelchairs in those <laughs> car, you know, yeah. I'm slugging it out walking two and a half miles, man. <laughs> You know, so it, it is, it is, I mean, some of that's just people are, unfortunately, they, they get a bad hand. Right. If you will. Right. But I, I, I realize that maintaining um, activity level is super important yeah. mentally and physically. Yeah. You know? Well, I was talking to Gary Carr a few years ago. You know, he was, he now just lives in Victoria, British Columbia, but he was splitting mm -hmm. his time between Las Vegas and, and BC. They got a little sick of the rain <laughs> and decided to go to <laughs> Vegas. And Gary would go out every morning. Uh, he, they lived on a golf, on the edge of a golf course. And Gary would bring this silent bass out and he would play scales for like two hours every morning. No joke. You know, he showed me, here's yeah. my bass, here I go. And yeah. he started lifting weights because he realized, he was saying, he started to realize he was losing some bone density as he was getting a little bit yeah. older. Yeah. And it was resistance at, training. Yeah, yeah, so it was yeah. messing with his vibrato, he said. He noticed that, yeah. like, just his yeah. left arm. And so um, it's just incredible to see. Uh, and, yeah, I think he's hitting 80 this year. And he is. You would, yeah. you would not yeah. know it, <laughs> you know, in many no, ways. No, I, I watched a little video of him recently, and he looks great. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, he, he really looks... He looks lean and he looks strong, mm -hmm. you know, but he, like you say, he had to make an adjustment because he realized changes were occurring. Not inevitable. I mean, they're inevitable that they're coming, but they're not inevitable uh, as a life sentence. You can you can alter that. Right. Somewhat. Right. You know, as well as we can. <laughs> as, you know. Well, I don't know. I don't know about you, but like uh, here we are. What is it? It's March fourth. So we're coming up on the one anniversary, one year anniversary of my last gig. <laughs> Me and too. I, I, okay. Me too. So, um, what, uh, what was, what were you doing a year ago at this point? Uh, yeah, I did a gig uh, the twenty fifth of February. I, I, you know, it's a little cloudy now. I, I the last gig I think was the twenty fifth or twenty sixth of February. Mm -hmm. I, I actually was, um, the, the last gig I did in Europe was on uh, February 9th, I flew back. Okay. From from Italy, we were in the town where it hit Whoa, first. Whoa, yeah. really? Okay. In a crowded club, man, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And I remember we flew back on the 9th, and at that time we were unaware, you know, but in the next couple of weeks I realized, oh my goodness, we were right there. Wow. You know, and it had to have been around because it didn't just happen overnight, you know. Yeah. So, um, but it's been an interestingly strange year, you know. Um, but I've been doing, a, I've been releasing a bunch of albums mm -hmm. on Bandcamp. Mm -hmm. And I recorded a duo record here with Tim Byrne. I recorded a duo record with Jane Ira Bloom that was done remotely. Mm -hmm. Like she recorded at her place. I recorded at my place with Zoom. And then we, we do the clap test and we line up the tracks, you know. Oh, I was so wondering. I, really, I, I was just listening to that this morning as I was puttering yeah. around. So so that's how you did it. So so record remotely, but you did a little did a little clap and okay. Yeah, we do wow. the clap because, so, but you know, it's, Jason, it's very odd because, um, you know, there's latency of about 250 milliseconds mm -hmm. is the average latency at that time. Mm -hmm. And we started trying to play together in like in April, May, um, just to play mm -hmm. and it was it was great but it was really horrible because we were using the the you know zoom sound mm -hmm. which was as glitchy as you can imagine but just the act of like interacting with somebody when you haven't been doing it, it was really incredible it was yeah. incredible high but then we actually worked it out so we got viable tracks and we got it coordinated so the thing that i still don't understand is if we counted something off and tried to play together, it, it was a disaster mm -hmm. because you saw the, the latency. But if we were just improvising and I went into a groove, her stuff was landing mm -hmm. in the right place. So I don't quite understand that. It might be that the latency cancels out mm -hmm. because we are definitely 250 milliseconds apart mm -hmm. when I like to line the tracks up. But in the process of be, the two computers, maybe it, I don't know. 
Yeah, it was. It's it's weird. We're, we're, it was weird. We're so tantalizingly close to be able to play in real time, and I, I went down this gigantic rabbit hole la- at the end of last summer, I think, with Mark Dresser and then mm-hmm. a, a colleague, his uh, actually at UC Irvine, Michael Dessen. And oh yeah, Michael. Yeah, sure. Okay, yeah, I figure you're all. This is we're, yeah. we're it's a small world, especially like your your shared interests. But so, have you experimented with Jack Trip, this software? <laughs> Well, I used I used uh, Quack Trip, which is the sort of McDonald's version okay. of Jack Trip. Jack Trip requires quite a bit of uh, entering of information in terminal and stuff yeah. like that. But what I'm using now is Sonibus. Mm. Have you used that at oh, all? I'm going to write that down and check it out. Sonibus. Yeah, Sonibus. S O N O B U S. I think it is. Um, the latency is way more manageable. Mm-hmm. So what Jane and I are doing is use Sonibus for the audio. Uh, we turn the uh, sound off in in uh, Zoom mm-hmm. and just use it for video. Mm-hmm. And then I record in Pro Tools, and she was recording, I think, in uh, you know the regular little Mac program. Yeah. Uh, what, what's it called? GarageBand. GarageBand. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You still get forty four point one, you know, mm-hmm. uh, files. But the uh, now when you do the clap test, do not look at the screen. <laughs> <laughs> because you know so she starts clapping and I join her mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and we play like eight beats together but you can't look right because right. it's like mm, uh, mm, uh, you know like that <laughs> Well, it's it's uh, so I, I had the got into this philosophical discussion with Michael and Mark about just latency in general. It's like I you know I, I contacted them just to talk about the software, but that was like the least interesting thing about collaborating remotely like this. You know, it's just like what like okay, so you can't play fast bop together, maybe you know, <laughs> um, the, uh, but that doesn't mean you can't make music together, right? And and if you just expand how you think about that, the possibilities are just so incredible, right? When you all all of a sudden you can connect from Israel to California to New York City to, to anywhere in between and and have some visual components I know Mark uh, with his deep tones for peace going back like 12 years at this point he's been playing yeah. around in that world and Michael and other folks too it's yeah. it's really interesting yeah. when you start to think about what you can even if you just if you just accept the latency and that latency can vary you know Michael and Mark live 80 miles apart so it's almost yeah. as if they're yeah. in the same room you and I if we tried to jam on Jack Trip, there would be enough that it would be, you know, not fast bop probably, but. Well, yeah, I think, first of all, that's one of the reasons why Jane and I just improvised. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because, and it was great because we had never really done a lot of open improvising together. I played in her band for years Mm -hmm. and it was, you know, mostly the medium of her own compositions Mm -hmm. where where there would be some, some open stuff. But this was really great because it turned out we have a really, really good rapport uh, musically and, uh, and so the, in a sense, we were able to actually play in all those languages. Mm-hmm. You know, my explanation of this sort of strange latency trap is in the case of like where we would play time and we would play a blues and she would be on the changes and in the time, you know, it was like it was not a, even though we knew we were 250 milliseconds apart. So my explanation is, if you're familiar with the Schrodinger cat thing from <laughs> physics, in this case, the cat is both dead and alive. You know, <laughs> It's not even in question at this point. We just go with it. So that's been a really uh, enlivening relationship. And we're, we're re- working on another album now, actually. We're continuing to record uh, duos, you know. Well, you, you certainly, uh, uh, the, the pandemic hit it and sounds like you just pivoted and started working on projects that maybe would have been a lot harder to do if you were, you know, touring to the extent that you had been. Plus, it's, you know, necessity is the mother of invention in yeah. this case. You know, it's like uh, we did have this poignant moment when we played the first time where we afterwards we were we were kind of like stunned because we, we realized how much we missed mm-hmm. interacting with other musicians. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, and um and then it grew from there into something that was viable, you know. So instead of a, an audience, you make a recording and share it with the public that way. Yeah. So there's a sort of completion of the cycle, if you will. Sure. You know. 
Well, I am, I, I, am, I am remaining optimistic about some sort of roaring 20s resurgence of music. And I, I can, I, living here in the Bay Area, you can see my sunny place here. Uh, we have the, the fortune of good weather or better weather than other areas. And, and there is, there, the music is on the streets in a way that I haven't seen since I moved to San Francisco. Um, there's this great uh, thing called the Bay Area Jazzmobile. They drive around, they set up in the park in my neighborhood in North Beach, and, and they pull out a tar in case it rains and they play and there are all these cafes around folks are checking out lots of places they're putting the band inside and then everybody's just outside watching and a couple of my friends are saying i i've got more gigs than i've had in a few years so well if you think about it the the pandemic's a huge correction Mm -hmm. on so many things in life Mm -hmm. i mean when, when when it started my girlfriend and I moved up to the country. Mm-hmm. She has a house in the country. So we just reinstalled up here in April. Mm-hmm. And nature went crazy last summer. Yeah. Remember how the air quality changed? Oh, I know. Yeah. It's crazy. You're driving down the FDR in New York and there you see four cars. Mm-hmm. Are you kidding? I mean, so, I mean, I remember I checked the air quality every day. It was like 19, yeah. 20 instead of 70, yeah. you know? And, and it's you know it, it it could be if we were cognizant an economic correction, mm-hmm. a sort of consumer correction on overconsumption, mm-hmm. but what it may do is reorient people's appreciation for live performance, hopefully. Oh. I, I, you know, I per, on a personal level, I will never take a concert for granted again. I will never, I, cause I was just thinking, you know, like a year, okay, I've just been playing through this the last month or so. I was subbing with San Francisco symphony. I never take that for granted, but also it's like, mm-hmm. you know, wheeling my bass, whatever. I got all these things on mm-hmm. my mind, um, going to the, to the SF jazz here and seeing, you know, I saw Larry Grenadier come through here and play a solo show fall, mm-hmm. I guess fall of 2019. Now at this point, I am, I am going to be the most av- uh, avid concert goer or there there right. is and I, I i just i can just see it on the streets i don't think i'm imagining it people are just so excited to hear music i mean the first bit of live music i heard since the shutdown was this funk band set up right on the waterfront here there's a little cafe and we went down and it was packed and people were so happy and you yeah. know the yeah. tips were coming in and like you know it, it's it's um it's i guess the, the other thing i think about is like it's not like at least here in san francisco things weren't firing on all cylinders anyway it's not like we were problem right. free back a year ago right. and right. talking to my artist friends i'm like the only bass player left in the city of san francisco because it's just so you know in, insanely nobody expensive. lives in san francisco no, it's too I, expensive I, I only live here because my <laughs> wife's a doctor like otherwise i would i go. would also not be <laughs> living in san francisco but yeah. i am starting to see some of these businesses that have been shuttered there are a couple of independent art galleries that have come back in we're seeing more music so hopefully this correction will break that way and yeah live music i at least personally i'm going to be at a lot of concerts as soon as i can yeah yeah i mean i th- also i think just the the sort of idea of community mm-hmm. that, that people take took for granted especially mm-hmm. in cities mm-hmm. like in, in cities you tend to like try to avoid people yeah you know because it's so crowded but when you say like a band you know sets up it's not just the music it's the sense of like coming together mm-hmm. you know like people being together which this whole thing has been about not being together yeah and and it and it's it's weighed heavily on a lot of folks, you know. Um, I mean, but you know, it's interesting too if you think about this. Writers and and musicians spend their lives in isolation, preparing for performances. So this played right into our hands. Yeah. You know, we're used to the isolation. Mm-hmm. Now I don't mean at this level, but if you think, you know, the the time we spend alone, um, which is kind of meditative practice time there was a great deal of it and most people were not wired for it yeah yeah you know we were in a sense i mean i you know i talked to a lot of my colleagues and most of them just got busy you know doing whatever they could do whereas a lot of other people who you know had structures imposed from outside of their personal lives without those structures they were at sea right you know so in a sense we were set up to deal with this better than most folks you know well, and then the, when you become six, more and more successful as an artist, that that time becomes so much more limited. A lot of the time, you're on the road, yeah. and like you were saying, you got yeah. your clarinet, which is great, but it's different than having all your instruments there and your your daw right. and everything. And so, yeah, yeah. yeah it's it's um, if 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 
people have been able to not freak out and stress out by reading the news and everything and use this time, which it seems like a lot of musicians, I know at least, have. Um, you yeah. know, it's, yeah. it's something that'll, that, that really, obviously, like for you, able to work on a lot of projects that probably would not have come in this level of velocity, you know. Yeah, also, um, you know, I'm, I'm doing mixing jobs for people mm. too. You know, a lot of people are producing stuff at home and they don't really know how to finish it off. Yeah. And, and, and clean it up and organize it. And, you know, so I've been doing some jobs like that, you know, just uh, mixing projects and mastering them for people. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, for, for, for band camp or whatever, yeah. you know. But um, yeah, it's a cottage industry, man. <laughs> you know. But I'm technically unemployed. I mean, I haven't, you know, I've done two gigs. I did a gig with Benny Wallace and Bill Frizzell and Nasheet Waits in like September outdoors at a, yeah. a big some rich person's house yeah. you know in connecticut and i did a solo concert and a duo concert up in kerhonkson new york at a little outdoor pavilion from my, my friend verna gillis put on these things wow. so um other than that it's, it's been in situ i would say in latin you know <laughs> Well, I see, you can see my bass in the corner there. You know, about, yeah, about one year ago, that bass went in that corner there, and and except for pulling it out to practice, it, it hasn't it hasn't left the front door yet. Um, but if you know, I had been my life had increasingly been shifting to be on the road. I mean, like the month that I was in the UK, and then I was in. Texas, and then I was in Pittsburgh, and I'm. Is this all to do to for doing podcasts and uh, stuff? I, I work in the industry too. I work for Eastman Music Company, so I'm their mm -hmm. strings product manager. So I go around oh, and do okay. clinics okay. and that kind of thing, and conduct. Right, so right. it's a the podcast is sort of uh, a little bit of it I do for the podcast. Like once a year, I try to take a trip to talk to people, but usually it's just cl you know clinics and tr training and all mm -hmm. that sort of stuff. But now that I've just been chilling chilling at home <laughs> for the last year, I'm thinking about how much of that I want to do when I when that starts back up like I'm starting to get a couple of uh, gig there was a, a potential Germany trip for me in May that just mm -hmm. won't work out because there's another trip in, in so I'm starting to see that and I'm just starting to think how much do I want to be on the road once the road comes back have you been thinking about that at all um, well yeah I mean I've I've been picking my spots mm -hmm. um, I can't. I won't. I don't want to travel the way I used to do in my twenties. Sure. But things were different then, right. you know. Uh, but I have to say, the airlines have not made it more pleasant. <laughs> right. I'll, I'll, I'll give you that. You know. Um, however, when I'm touring with Reed Kane and, and Eric Friedlander, people like that, the various things I'm doing, it's at a pretty high level. So we, you know, but you know, you still have to get in a van with some guy you don't know. Mm -hmm to drive somewhere right you know right and, and that that can always be a, a <laughs> dicey affair but and and just the, the sort of physical displacement but the other thing is we're doing shorter tours i mean i've, I've even done a bunch of one-nighters in europe which is really weird yeah. you know because you you basically lose three days and come back a bit hammered yeah you know? yeah well that's so the I mean, the question for me is is one of of employment too, because you know the international trips are important to me uh, economically. Right. You know. Right. So I don't want to give that up, and I also love uh, you know I'm a cuisine guy, so like you know I love going to Europe. Yeah. And anywhere actually, you know. Right. Right. Yeah, me, me too. I, my, my sort of, I guess in an ideal world, if I could go out of town once a month, maybe, or average it like that, that might be perfect for me. The way it's been the last few years is it's like I'm out of town nine weeks in a row and then a couple Oof. weeks, you know, back at home or, or then, you know. So I've definitely thought a lot. And part of me likes that chaos uh, and just the, you know, but, but I certainly don't get that meditative time that we're talking about yeah, here. Yeah. Um, you don't have children, do you? And I don't have children, yeah. Yeah, and and, okay. and now that we've been yeah. in pandemic mode, I've I've got a dog, and we've got more responsibilities here. Still no yeah. kids though, but it's something that um, it's just something that I, that I think about, and I know it's like we, with the if the road is what pays the bills, obviously you need it. But it, like, do you right. is once a month like an ideal thing for you, or do you have a sort of ratio like in an ideal world what you'd want to do in terms of that? Well, I used to think of it when I was you know back in the eighties and nineties and thousand whatever i you know i was touring up to 150 days a year wow okay which is a lot yeah you know but i i mean i got friends like nasheed waits he was on the road as much as anybody i know mm -hmm. you know he was doing all kinds of gigs so 
Um, and I don't want to do that. That's too exhausting. And also, it's too much output and not enough input mm -hmm. for me. I like to spend time working on things and then perform. Mm -hmm. And also, the, the value of a performance has changed in the sense that like it's there's no such thing as a bad night or even a bad moment on stage now. It's like the concentration is total. No distractions. Wow. You know, yeah. that, that feels great. You know, the, re the reverence for that performance has, got, has grown deeper for me. You know? Yeah, for sure. It's total commitment. So, whereas as a younger person, I was, you know, more distracted on the road and, you know, into the trappings and things like that. You know, just, you're young, right. you know? Right, But I, I watched the sort of attrition rate on gigs go to zero to the point where it's like as soon as I hit that it's I'm in that's it wow until we're done you know yeah. and that that's the thing that uh, one has to remember when you're out there that's the reason you're there not the 30 hour trip and the you know whatever trials and tribulations right. of road life but nine weeks on the road and two weeks home no 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 that's a no, little thank rough. you no Duke Ellington <laughs> band for me thank you those cats were on the road 50 weeks a year wow in a bus it's hard for me to even imagine, but... Yeah. Wow. Well, get out the alcohol. Yeah, That's right. what happens. <laughs> well, Mark, I knew this would happen. I, I, could, I could talk to you for five hours, and, we could, and we'd, we'd never run out of stuff to, to chat about. Uh, we could talk about telematics and, uh, and, and life well, on the road. Well, if you want to talk about some specific base stuff, that's fine, too, you know. Well, what, what we should probably do, let's, let's, uh, maybe we'll put in a pin in it here for this and do a round two at some point, and we could talk just okay. base. The, the dirty secret of this podcast, or not dirty, is like, I must never talk about base. I just want to know. It's more like, it's more like life conversations, but... Uh, well, yeah, base, and, and process. It's important. Yeah. No, you're right. Yeah. You're right. I agree with you. That, I think uh, the, the gearhead stuff only goes so far, you know. Yeah, for for me, for sure. I just have never been that that. In, you know, I mean, I it's interesting, but it's uh, not as interesting for me, at least, as what we've been talking about. So. Yeah. Have you done much on on recording? I think you did some stuff about recording bases, right? A, a tiny bit. I'm just such a not an expert on that. So, like, I, mm -hmm. I like talking to people about that. Um, mm -hmm. I'm certainly no, um, you know, no no expert myself. I'll do like a YouTube review about some microphone, and then people, I'll get, you know, that'll that'll not blow up, but all of a sudden people will ask me all these technical questions. I'll I'll say like, I know this is the pod mic by Rode, and <laughs> I, I should yeah, just just <laughs> send, send them to the chat room. There we go. You know? There we go. <laughs> yeah that's uh, well yeah it, it's interesting because the um i'm kind of involved a bit in that mm -hmm. area just because of the audio stuff and mm -hmm. you know uh and I've, I've always been fascinated well for you know when you think about the recordings that you heard as a kid that yeah. caught your ear and the sound of the bass in a certain sort of way that really struck you mm -hmm. so um that's always been a kind of an interest in mine in trying to create a sound that has that magic in it you know because yeah. the instrument does have magic in it you know there's a book i read back when i was teaching that electronic music class i started to get into just i guess we'll call it like amateur mixing that that's that's mm -hmm. the, that's the the most charitable <laughs> label i could give what i but i read this book that i called zen and the art of mixing and mm -hmm. uh eric Serafin, i think is the person who's a hip-hop producer but that it was written in a really interesting way it made me really just think about um and and this was at a point when i was doing a lot of conducting and as i started to think about mm -hmm. mixing i started to it started to change how i thought about the orchestra in front of me i started to almost see the see the levels and see the tracks and um think about the effects i mean not exactly but it really it really changed my perspective no, it, it makes it yeah yeah it's another way of perceiving live music in a way yeah. you know like uh and especially like an orchestra that's that's really a broad you know different levels yeah. you know uh lots of things to control i've done a lot of conducting as well so it's i, I know what you're talking about Mark, thanks a bunch. Folks, check out that album and Mark's other albums. Markhelios.bandcamp.com will get you there. And I've got that linked up in the show notes. And that's the sort of chat you just heard that I love so much about doing this podcast. And it's so fun to do these with anybody, but I love talking to experienced jazz musicians because I do think of these conversations as improv. I mean, conversation, maybe this is obvious, but conversation is a form of improvisation that we all participate in, unless we're very strange and script out everything we say to everybody. And to talk about music with some 
somebody who's well versed in improvised music, I always find that those conversations go in interesting directions. And I knew this would be a lot of fun uh, for me, hopefully for Mark. I was not disappointed on my end. And yeah, we got to do it again. Uh, one of these days, Mark, uh, next project or when we're both in the same city or anything like that. This is a bunch of fun for me to do. I never imagined I would be doing this. If you, I mean, I guess I have the last 13 years since that I've been doing it or however long it's been. But, but uh, you know, if I go back to my college days, I never thought I would be doing this. It has been a remarkable self-improvement and self-education or education, educational experience on my end. I feel like a different person having done almost 800 of these. I'm sure I am <laughs> sitting down for what must be around 800 hours and just focused listening and dialogue with people that are doing interesting things in your domain. I think that's good for anybody. I would recommend it to anybody. 800 is a lot, uh, yeah, but even if you do one one a month or even if you say you have a podcast and you lie and you just, you just turn off devices and talk to somebody for an hour, I think there's a lot of value in this kind of dialogue, particularly, uh, you know, not to uh, beat, beat a you know, this drum, but you know, in, in a world that is where attention is so fragmented and we're scrolling and we're getting things in bite-sized chunks to so just sit down and really get to know somebody over a long period of time. I think that's the beautiful thing about conversation. And yeah, wow, that got a little deep than I was expecting. Uh, but so I will close out <laughs> right here and thank the team that put these together: Michael Cooper, Steve Hinchy, Trevor Jones, and Mitch Mori. Mitch makes beautiful day, beautiful daces. Oh boy, Jason, yeah, you are losing it. Beautiful bases in the Dallas Fort Worth area. Learn more at MitchMoring.com. I'm your host, Jason Heath, and we will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum. <laughs>